First of all, I'd like to thank Mauro for the invitation. This is my second time in Primus, and it's very, it's always a pleasure to, to be here. I tried to uh, organize my presentation and my, uh, my personal view about the challenge that we have in science in this kind of uh, diagram here. So basically, I tried to do science, of course, in, in the lab. I try to do a lot of popularization of science, and I will try to explain why I'm also doing that. And all of these things, they are, of course, uh, involved with the challenge that I, I do, uh, trying to set up my lab with the questions that I have in the lab. And then this is what I'm going to, to show to you. So first, thank you all again. And I will start with these uh, two phrases from this uh, book of uh, Peter Medawar, Advice to a Young Scientist. This guy is a Nobel Prize in the 60s and a British one, but uh, for maybe some of you don't know, he's, he was born in Brazil. He was born in, here in Rio, in the Petropolis. And, uh, but then he was, of course, from the British family, and then he left. And uh, he, in this book, he discussed two things. The first thing is about the myths that are behind being a scientist, like the kind of thing of being invincible, superior, and like a genius. And then at the end, he also discussed about what this really doesn't matter. What's important is to have co common sense, to, be, to have inquiry in mind, and also to do a lot of work, to really uh, do, uh, go to the bench and, and to work. And one thing that really uh, involved uh, with is try to uh, spread the word to the, uh, to the young people that like, we are very, we are like average people, like we are average guys. And this is also important because we don't want to be considered as like someone different or superior or uh, awkward or whatever, because if you do that, we're not going to have more science. We need more scientists. And we just have to show to everybody that we are completely common. We just decided to do one kind of job that's different from being like a soccer player or a lawyer or anything else. Okay, uh, so this is the, the, the title of my talk, Challenges Faced in the Scientific Career. This is me, like 25 years ago, that's okay. But uh, just to remember that like, I came from an average family, from middle class family in Rio. Like uh, there's no scientists in the family, actually there's no no, no one from my family went to, uh, to a graduate school, to, the, to a college or to the university. So I didn't really have, uh, I just have the freedom of my dad and my mother to say, do whatever you want. So this is what I think that was important. But it's also to emphasize that like completely average guy. So my brothers, they do different things. One is a musician, the other is uh, do other things. So it's very open uh, people there. Okay, but then uh, when I was in the high school, I met this guy. He was the father of my one girlfriend in the high school. And then I realized, oh, there are scientists here, and they are very nice people. And then I remind him, uh, this reminded me about other uh, story that, was, that happens with a friend from uh, Belém. His name is uh, Luis Carlos Silveira. He was telling me once that he was in the cab talking to the taxi driver, and then the, uh, you know, that kind of uh, chat that we have with these, the drivers. And then the driver asked him, what, what do you do? And then said, well, I'm a scientist. And the guy looked behind, are you sure you are a scientist in Brazil? I thought it was science just in Japan and Europe. So this is the kind of thing that we are dealing with. Like we think that everybody knows about it, that we're doing science here, for example, in Brazil, but th this is really not the case. But because I met this guy, I, I realized that we have science here and to be science is something interesting. But, uh, I'm really like a consequence of the start of the popularization, popularization of science in Brazil. Remember like when I was a kid, there was of course no internet, nothing like this, but there were these two magazines and I love to wait like for every month to go to the, uh, to the, to buy these two magazines. It was like wonderful. And then basically I'm, I'm a consequence to, of the start of the popularization of science in Brazil. And this is why I think that I, I try to work uh, with popularization of science, like not only as a, as a, for fun, but because I really think that's strategically important for us to do it. So I, I, I wrote a book for uh, like to, about stem cells. That's a very pop, I like to popularize the, the term in Brazil. I have a, a, a column that we like to, I write every month to this Ciência uh, Hoje online. And they will also have a website in, the, in the, our institute. But something that I'm trying to, that I started to do uh, two years ago, and that I'm, I'm, then I'm going to tell another story, is try to really to put science in a very different way and to, to, to much more people. And what's the best way to show science to everybody, at least in Brazil, is if you go to the soap opera. So if you go to a soap opera in Brazil, everybody watches the soap opera, everybody. So if we have a waste 
to show it in the soap opera, that would be very important for us to do science. So I'm just going to show to you one example of something that like, I wrote with one other uh, neuroscientist in, in Brazil, that's Roberto Lange. And this scene uh, was uh, in one uh, soap opera that was called Viver a Vida, that was a very popular soap opera in Brazil, I think that was last year or two years ago. And the case was, we have, uh, I work with stem cells, there is other people working with stem cells, but there are also, I'm going to show a little bit more about it later, but there are also some clinics abroad that they, they are not really related with any kind of uh, scientific method, but they are selling treatment to, for, for people to go abroad and they pay like 50,000 euros or something like that. Then go there, they, they receive some cells, then they come back to Brazil and basically nothing happens. They don't uh, improve anything, they don't recover. And uh, actually some of them really get bad, uh, worse the, the scenario. So it was important to try to, to show it to the, to the people. And uh, fortunately, we had the opportunity to, to discuss with some of the writers of the soap opera. And then we wrote this scene here. I'm sorry because I don't have the subtitles. Bom, eu sei que vocês estão dispostos a tudo para a Luciana voltar a andar. Mas é preciso cautela para falar de células-tronco. Eu e minha equipe, nós estamos fazendo o que é possível para a reabilitação dela. Muito obrigada, doutor Moretti. Nós gostaríamos de agradecer a dedicação de vocês. Mas eu andei pesquisando, eu li um pouco sobre pessoas tetraplégicas, como a Luciana, e vi que algumas pessoas voltaram a andar. Ou tiveram um progressos significativos, o senhor entende? É, o senhor mesmo nos disse que o Brasil está muito avançado nas pesquisas sobre células-tronco e que há grande investimento na área. Não, nós estamos muito avançados, realmente. O Brasil, internacionalmente, é uma referência na área. As pesquisas são constantes e interruptas. Já temos até uma lei que é a favor do, da utilização de células-tronco embrionárias humanas, o que é ótimo. Pois é, mas e na prática? O que é estão que fazendo por aí? Pessoas que voltaram a ter mais movimentos com as pernas, por exemplo, por causa dessas experiências? Nada ainda com comprovação, Tereza. Nós já sabemos que as células tronca milionárias, elas recuperam animais em laboratório. E ter ultrapassado essa fase já é um grande progresso para as pesquisas. É, resta agora saber se elas vão responder ao que a gente quer, né? Uhum. Ou seja, o tratamento vai dar certo ou não em humanos, né? De que maneira as células-tronco podem ser uma esperança de fato? Olha, as células-tronco embrionárias são capazes de se transformar em tecidos de qualquer parte do corpo. No caso da Luciana, ela sofreu um trauma na cervical, uma lesão medular. Então, a ideia dos pesquisadores é que elas seriam capazes de reconectar os circuitos que foram interrompidos pela lesão. Entende? Ai, mas só de ouvir é uma chama de emoção e de luz. Mas isso ainda não pode ser feito. Não, ainda não. É, no atual estágio das pesquisas, nós não temos resposta de como controlar essas células para que elas se transformem em células, digamos, certas. Por exemplo, se nós é, injetamos, aplicamos no cérebro, elas têm que gerar neurônios e não, não ossos. Compreender? Como é delicado isso? É, bom, eu e minha filha Mia, nós vimos alguns relatos de pessoas que se sentiram melhor, que conseguiram mais movimentos depois de se submeterem a alguns tratamentos feitos no exterior. Olha, eu, eu entendo a agonia de vocês, mas eu não posso abrir falsas expectativas. Esse, esse é um projeto para o futuro. Existem milhares de experiências em andamento, muito investimento na área. E aqui mesmo, no nosso país, tudo com excelente qualidade. Né? Inclusive os neuros, os cientistas estão muito entusiasmados. E existe sim, uma luz no fim do túnel. Mas é preciso... Percorrer esse túnel. Se fosse sua filha, o senhor levaria a sua filha a se consultar com algum desses médicos? Olha, sinceramente, falando, falando como médico e é amigo de vocês, eu não aconselho investir em dinheiro e expectativa nessas tentativas sem nenhuma comprovação científica. Um ou outro paciente pode ter mexido um pouco mais o joelho ou a perna, 
mas nada representativo do ponto de vista científico. Uhum. As estatísticas são mínimas, né? não há nenhum indício que, de que esses métodos têm uma eficácia como, como tratamento terapêutico. Né? Fora que a gente não sabe se tais experiências podem fazer mal aos pacientes. Tá certo. Acho que ficou mais claro, né, Tereza? Já tomamos muito tempo deles. Ah, imagina. Fique à vontade, nós estamos aqui à disposição de vocês. Obrigada, doutor Moretti. Eu entendi. Eu acho que eu entendi. Ai, que pena. Eu vim com uma ponta de esperança. Mas, por favor, doutor Moretti, nos mantenha informados sobre qualquer avanço. Hum. Hum? Fiquem tranquilos. Eu vou ser os olhos de vocês na busca da recuperação do Luciano. Obrigada. E foi muito interessante porque eles, basicamente, não mudaram muito sobre o texto. Então, foi uma muito boa oportunidade. E agora, nesta nova soap opera que é chamada Finnish Tampa, esta nova one, eles também contactaram a nós e agora eles criaram um novo carácter para a soap opera que eles vão ser um cientista que está começando um lab. Então, foi interessante porque o cara vai ter que começar o seu lab. Então, foi o desafio de como começar um lab, como obter dinheiro. Então, vamos ver como problems of the importation of the things so let's see how they how much of the things they will put in soap opera but at least we are in contact with 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 him